Section 30.7, X-rays. So X-rays were first discovered uh, by using a high voltage source that uh, accelerates electrons, right? If you heat a filament, electrons are given off, and if the electrons are moving fast enough and they strike a metal target, then they give off this radiation light, but in the region of X-rays. So this is one way you can produce X-rays. Another way it turns out for really weak X-rays, you can just uh, remove some pieces of scotch tape. That produces X-rays too. So there's a big difference in effect on how energetic they are. Uh, but this is one way of producing X-rays. And if you do this, uh, you'll find that the intensity of the X-ray follows a pattern. So this is the X-ray intensity per unit wavelength. Uh, and it's as a function of wavelength here. And so you notice that there's sort of this general shoulder here smeared out that's known as Bremsstrahlung. That's the fact that there's going to be x-rays given off just by the fact that electrons are striking the metal. Cool. It's called Bremsstrahlung means breaking radiation. So it comes from the fact that the electrons have to slow down. The, the key that we really want to focus in on are these sharp peaks, K sub alpha, K sub beta. These are known as characteristic lines or characteristic x-rays because they depend on the target material themselves. These ones are Ks, which stands for the n equals one state. And they're saying that uh, the electron is able to knock out one of the n equals one electrons of the metal target. That leaves a hole for a higher electron to fall down into that gap. And as the electron falls down into the gap, it's going to give off the extra energy in the form of a photon. It's just at the right wavelength for this particular material. Well, these characteristic lines depend on the material because every atom has different energy levels. So they'll give off different characteristic ones. And it's one of the ways, if you're working with x-rays, like with x-ray diffraction, x-ray spectroscopy, you can identify your particular material by figuring out uh, which peaks appear uh, for the x-ray intensity. The other thing to note here is this lambda sub naught. That's the cutoff wavelength. That's the minimum wavelength that we'll see. And it, it's set just based upon, in the previous slide, the potential difference of how much you've accelerated those electrons, how fast they're moving. That determines how much energy the photon can have when it's given off. Now, x-rays are really useful. If you've gone to the dentist, you've probably had x-rays taken there. Uh, the simple form of the x-ray is just one where they put a photographic film like behind your teeth and then they send a short pulse of x-rays at them and the film records the x-ray pulse, right, where bone absorbs x-rays better than other forms, other parts of the body, and so you can see the bone and all the details really clearly. Disadvantage, though, is that it, it gives you sort of a shadow effect, right, where it just, you have to line it up very carefully, right, but then you see anything in between. And it can be, it's one-dimensional, so it can be hard sometimes to reconstruct things. So a fancier form of using x-rays in the medical field right now is CAT scans or CT scans, which is computerized axial tomography uh, or computer-assisted tomography or just computerized tomography. And what happens with CAT scans is you go in and the detectors sweep over a huge range and can even send multiple x-ray pulses at once with a detector on the other side. So instead of just getting a 1D picture, they're able to circle around and get a much more three-dimensional picture of you, right? So here's an example of the heart and the abdomen, where it's instead of just that 2D image like you get at the dentist's office or if you've broken an arm, it's this very detailed rendering that can show quite a few more details. This is still a current area of research of trying to find ways that involve less radiation on the person. One of the ways that's currently being examined is instead of using x-rays, using protons. So that's just a bit of an aside, but that, that is the section on x-rays, which do with the atomic structure and how electrons can fall between set energy levels. Another key application of the atomic structure and our understanding of it is the laser. 
which is one of the most useful inventions of the recent times. So there's a few things that are required to make a laser work. One is the idea of stimulated emission. What is this? Well, in general, what the default is that there will be spontaneous emission. That is, if you have an electron that's in a higher energy level, it will at some point randomly fall down to the smaller energy level. And when it does, it'll give off a photon in some random direction. But it's a pretty randomized process, as hopefully you're picking up on. Interestingly, if you have an electron in that higher level, and you have a photon that comes in with the exact same energy as the difference between those two levels, then it can actually cause the electron to fall down and give off a photon with the exact same energy and in the same direction with the same phase. So one photon goes in, you get two photons out and those two photons are identical to each other. So we've now made our light twice as intense in one go. And this will repeat multiple times. Now, another thing that we're going to need in order to get this stimulated emission happening regularly enough to amplify everything is something known as population inversion. So the default state of most atoms is the electrons are going to fill the smaller, lower energy level first. And there will be some in higher energy levels, but it's not the default place to be, right? We like to be as lazy as possible. But population inversion is where, given some outside help and parameters, you can get more of the electrons in the higher energy state than in the lower energy state. Now we're setting it up that they are ready to fall down when we get that stimulated emission coming in. So this is the way to set it up for success, getting that population inversion where you have more in the higher state than before. So here's a depiction of a typical uh, helium neon laser, which is, I think, the first laser invented. It's the common one. Anytime you see a red laser, it's probably helium neon laser. And so what we have is there's a high voltage that's placed on this tube that's filled with helium and neon gas particles. And then the high voltage is there to create that population inversion, to get more of the atoms in the higher energy state. And then when a, a photon comes in and happens to stimulate one of those higher energy electrons to go down a level by that amount, it creates two more photons, right? And those two photons then create four more photons, right? Where each of these photons coming in at the higher energy electron cause it to fall down a level, and then we get two photons out. And so we're getting this multiplying effect, and it's amplified even further by the fact that both ends of the tube are silvered to be mirrors. So that it reflects on itself, and so it just starts going back and forth side to side very quickly and getting more and more amplified. One side is only partially silvered, so it can let some of the photons pass through, and that becomes the laser beam, which is very, actually quite narrow and is monochromatic. It's a single wavelength because all of these photons are exactly in phase and identical, which is quite remarkable. So taking a closer look for helium and neon specifically, uh, it turns out that helium and neon have a very similar uh, energy difference between the ground state and the ray state of 20.61 in the helium or 20.66 in the neon, pretty darn similar. And so if you excite a helium uh, atom or electron to the higher energy level, then if it bumps into a neon, it can give the neon that excited state. And that's a metastable state, which means that the uh, electrons in this higher energy level will hang out there for a little bit. They aren't gonna just instantly fall down. They can wait for the stimulated emission to come. So metastable is another key th factor in lasers. And then neon has these two energy levels that are relatively close together, right? Where as they fall down to this closer one, they can give off a photon of exactly 633 nanometers, which is right in the red spectrum. It's very precise. And so lasers are a very consistent source of light is why we use them in experiments using diffraction and interference because lasers are really useful. Lasers are also used in medical fields. So th section 30.9 briefly looks at medical applications of the laser. And one is 
having to do with vision, right? So one method of using a laser to correct vision without having to wear glasses all the time is you can change the shape of the cornea by sending in laser pulses. So if the cornea is too steep, then it bends the light in too soon. This is the case of nearsightedness. And so you can remove some of the front of that to flatten out the cornea so that it's not too steep. And then you're able to focus further on the objects that are further away. Similarly, if you're farsighted, that has to do with your cornea being too flat. It's not, it's focusing the light uh, it's somewhere behind the back of your retina where you can't see it. So if you can steepen the cornea, if you can make it a little sharper, then it can focus sooner and it will fix the farsightedness. So for farsightedness, they put a little mask to protect the center of the cornea and then they remove from either edge to make it a steeper dome. So that's one way that the cornea can be shaped. Uh, another way is this is specific to LASIK eye surgery. And for this one, there's actually a flap of the cornea that's lifted up. And then the laser pulse is sent in to remove material underneath to change the cornea properly. The flap can go back down and it heals without needing stitches, which is amazing that all of this works. I, yeah. So it's really great that we have the laser. There are many other applications of it. But these just highlight a couple ways that the laser is used in the medical field. And so this pulls us through chapter 30, which looks at the nature of the atom. This is a nice little gift that highlights if you have an electron in a higher energy state, boom, it will occasionally fall down to a lower energy state and give off a photon. So here it is in the higher energy state. As it comes around, doop, it gives off that photon. In the lower energy state, if a photon comes in with just the right energy, it can kick it up to that higher energy state. And so it keeps cycling through. So in this chapter, we've studied the nature of the atom. And we now have, a, I hope you have, a much better understanding of the different ways to describe the states of an atom, the different uh, energy levels that an electron can have, and how it can relate to incoming light or light that is given off by said electron to produce things like lasers, which is awesome. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I would love to dialogue further on this.